pro-vice-chancellor, pro-chancellor. As a medical student at Birmingham, it was generally acknowledged by his peers that Nick Craddock has a brain the size of a planet. Whether this was connected with the fact that, after abandoning the idea of being a train driver at the age of four, all he ever wanted to do was be an astrophysicist is not known. Professor Nick Craddock went to Bishop Vesey Grammar School in Sutton Coldfield, north of Birmingham, where the teaching of maths and science was particularly strong. He progressed to Cambridge University, where he read natural sciences, concentrating on theoretical physics. His dream of being a physicist seemed on course. However, during his degree, he began to think about studying medicine, as although he enjoyed the intellectual challenge involved in physics, he knew that he wanted to do something which involved people and that would make a tangible contribution both to individuals and society. After his graduation from Cambridge with a first in natural sciences in 1980, he joined the five-year medical degree programme here in Birmingham. He found that his scientific training gave him a very valuable perspective on medicine, and he graduated with honours, the medical equivalent of a first. Although he says he did quite well in psychiatry as a student, this actually means he was one of a very small number of students awarded honours in the subject, but he did not particularly enjoy it. His interest did lie in neuroscience, and on graduating in 1985, he embarked on a career in neurology. He chose it as he thought it was the thinking person's medical specialty. He worked in both neurology and neurosurgery in his first year as a doctor, and was then accepted onto a medical rotation at City Hospital in Birmingham, which started with six months of neurology. He found that the most interesting people he came across in his work were those with neuropsychiatric or psychological problems. Allied to this, his then girlfriend, now wife Bridget, was training in psychiatry. Gradually, it dawned on Nick that he was far more interested in Bridget's job than his own. He resigned from the medical rotation and signed up for psychiatry. One can only imagine the consternation and bemusement this must have caused the medical hierarchy. Nick trained as a psychiatrist in the West Midlands and alongside his work, he undertook a Master of Medical Science degree at this university. During his training, he attended a lecture on the genetics of mental illness given by Peter McGuffin, Professor of Psychological Medicine at Cardiff. This opened his eyes to the possibilities of psychiatric genetics, an area where his facility for mathematics and biology gave him a natural advantage, and one which he felt offered the best chance of being able to make a significant difference in mental illness. Nick then embarked on research into psychiatric genetics, funded initially by a Sheldon Fellowship in the West Midlands, where he worked very closely with colleagues in Cardiff. And after two years, he moved to Cardiff on a Wellcome Trust Fellowship for three years, the middle year being spent in St. Louis, Missouri. On returning to Cardiff, he completed his PhD in 1995, became a consultant, and an active researcher into the genetics of bipolar disorder, previously known as manic depression. In 1997, he moved back to Birmingham as Professor of Molecular Psychiatry and only three years later became Head of the Department of Psychiatry. It was at this time that he and his colleagues began to establish the UK Bipolar Disorder Research Network, which now numbers 6,000 families affected by the illness, the largest such sample in the world. In 2002, the focus at Birmingham having changed, Nick moved back to Cardiff where he has stayed. The links with Birmingham, however, remain extremely strong and the research network is 
run from both institutions, with Dr Lisa Jones, a psychologist in the Department of Psychiatry, leading the Birmingham team. Nick anticipates that in the next 20 to 30 years, understanding the genetics of bipolar disorder will enable doctors to target treatments appropriately to the individual. Professor Craddock's team in Cardiff has also developed a psychological intervention for people with bipolar disorder. This involves education about their condition, delivered in person or by computer, individually or in groups, according to preference, particularly looking at how to recognise the events that trigger a relapse and thus enabling the person to act quickly before they become more unwell. In addition to being a world leader in psychiatric genetics and a pioneer of genome-wide association studies, Nick Craddock has done much to reduce the stigma associated with bipolar disorder. Through the programme he made with Stephen Fry, The Secret Life of the Manic Depressive, and by being the advisor to EastEnders on its storyline about a character with bipolar disorder. He demonstrates his strong commitment to public engagement and education about bipolar disorder as scientific advisor to Bipolar UK and action on postpartum psychosis. He is the treasurer of the Royal College of Psychiatrists and was until recently the chair of its academic faculty. He has published over 370 academic papers. He has been president of the International Society of Psychiatric Genetics as it, and is integral to the Wellcome Trust Case Control Con Consortium Study of Common Diseases. This year, he was made an honorary professor of psychiatry at the University of Oxford. When the Craddocks, Nick and Bridget, and their children, Sandy, Joss and Rosie, who are all here today, moved back to Cardiff 12 years ago, they purchased 18 acres of land with their house in the Vale of Glamorgan. Here they keep pigs, alpacas, cows, geese, sheep and chickens. They have recently planted two acres of apple trees from which they intend to make cider. Nick Craddock is not only an incredibly clever academic, he is someone who cares passionately that every individual with a mental health problem gets the best treatment possible. His research is transforming the way psychologists, doctors and society view bipolar disorder. He is someone who wears his ability, which is considerable, and his achievements, which are enormous, lightly. He is naturally modest and self-effacing. Indeed, there cannot be many world experts who, during a telephone conference of collaborators on an academic paper for the journal Nature, would say, I'm awfully sorry, but I'll have to finish soon, as I need to milk my goats. Pro-Chancellor, to you and to the University, I present Nicholas John Craddock, deemed worthy of admission to the degree of Doctor of Medicine, honoris causa. By virtue of my authority as Pro-Vice-Chancellor, I admit you to the degree of Doctor of Medicine, honoris causa. Any congratulations. Pro-Chancellor, Pro-Vice-Chancellors, graduates, graduands and guests, thank you uh, for the honour of conferring the degree of Doctor of Medicine on me and for the great privilege in being able to share today with graduates, graduands and their family on this uh, celebration of an important milestone in their lives. Any degree is a result of a huge amount of concerted work over a long period of time, but without the support of our family and friends and colleagues, uh, we wouldn't get there, and it's really a day for us all to celebrate today, and I'm very grateful to, to be here sharing that with everybody. Now, for most people here, you knew what degree that you were doing, and you worked very hard, and you've got it. 
I've been in this room, this great hall, on two previous occasions. You, you kind of heard, heard that from the public orator um, in 1985 when I graduated in medicine and then in 1991 when I got a master's degree in, in psychiatry. And I've been kind of trying to think whether or not the degree for me today is the easiest one I've ever had or the hardest one. Because in one way, I didn't know I was going to get it till I opened an envelope from the vice chancellor and that was an immense pleasure. But I suppose also it's acknowledging um, a lot of work done over a lot of years. But whether it's the easiest or the hardest, it's certainly an enormous pleasure to be recognized by this great university in the town where I was born and grew up. And uh, I have very strong feelings and bonds to Birmingham, the town, the city, and to the university. In the two degree ceremonies where I was sitting as a graduand and then a graduate, um, there was an honorary um, degree conferred. And I remember on the second occasion, it was the very first astronaut that we ever had in Great Britain, Helen Sharman, and I remember her talking to us, and that made, made an impression on me. I'm supposed to talk, give a few words to say something about my experience that might perhaps hopefully stick in the minds of our graduates and graduands today, and I want to just say just a little bit about education and a little bit about experience. So you heard from the public orator that I've done a few different degrees and courses and things, and I started off doing physics and mathematics. And I have to be quite honest, in my day-to-day -day work as a psychiatrist, I hardly ever use quantum mechanics or tensor calculus. But the mode of thinking instilled into one in that type of degree carries forward throughout one's life and it gives you a particular way of tackling a problem and thinking things through. And in truth, some of the mathematics that I learnt, I've later used in genetics. In my degree in medicine, I learnt that it's really important to think about the big picture and you do have to understand at least a bit about a very wide range of things to make sense of the world. And particularly when you're trying to help people with problems, patients, people with problems. Because you've got to be pragmatic. You mustn't follow one rigid way of thinking, one school of thought. You must be willing to pick whichever approach is helpful. Is it social, biological, psychological? You must be open-minded. You must be willing to do that. And to also know when you're not the person who can provide the best help and you pass over to a, a colleague with different training. And that's a very important thing to to, to understand. In my training as psychiatry, and that's really what I am, I'm a card-carrying psychiatrist, I learnt about the very broad range of understanding that's needed that really does span sociology, psychology and neuroscience and biology. And you have to be able to bring that together to help people with very, very complex problems. Um, and that is a very important lesson. No one simple, single answer will do or fit everything. And in my genetics work, which is really the main area I've undertaken research-wise, I think I learned an important lesson in that actually you can apply some really quite basic science to at least get some inroads into understanding the most complex aspects of the most complex organ in the body, the brain. So we're dealing with higher uh, central functions of the brain, our emotions, our behavior, our, our feelings, um, the way we think. And yet, something as, as apparently straightforward as molecular genetics can actually give you some clues about what's going on in the brain of people when they're reacting to the environment and um, their emotions are changing. So that's an important lesson. But, of course, genetics tells us a little bit, but it doesn't tell us all the other things that we need to use sociology and psychology for. So I think education is fantastic in that it gives us a way of thinking about things, and it also does, of course, give us some knowledge, 
which I have to tell you will be immediately out of date the minute you leave this room and you'll have to keep updating it during your life and knowing what changes, but you will carry forward important information as well as a training in thinking for the rest of your careers, but be open to that need to change what the information is as it, as it develops. Now, in terms of experience, there is actually no way of getting out of the need to have experience, particularly in something like healthcare, mental health, and in fact, in other areas too. I can absolutely confirm to you from my working career that I have not met a patient yet that ever read a textbook. So you can have learned the theory and all the rest of it, but the way it will present, the way people will tell you about things, it will not be exactly in the textbook. And you get an understanding of that from experience and also from talking to colleagues with experience. And there's a balance there between coming along with new knowledge and ideas and being willing to challenge orthodoxy but also being able to respect when somebody has got that additional level of experience and actually accept that what they're saying might be right. And, and that's, it's not always that straightforward to do that. And I can certainly remember as a junior doctor seeing uh, patients in clinic who perhaps were on quite strange concoctions of different treatments, and I would think, well, that's doesn't seem like that should be right, that can't possibly be right, and they have perhaps been on it and well for several years, and I would perhaps think I should change it, and lo and behold, the person became less well when I changed it. And I started to realize, hmm, okay, there's textbook stuff, and that's important, but there's experience as well, and we must bring the two together to help people or to do our jobs well in, in whatever we're doing. From the point of view of my genetics research, one of the important things I learned, again about experience, is when you do an experiment and you get an amazingly strong result and you're really excited, the most likely reason for that turns out to be a mistake. And you learn that by experience. The first time it happens, you think, oh, I can't possibly have made a mistake. And then you pretty rapidly realize most of the times, if it looks almost too good to be true, it is. And certainly people in my research group used to hate coming along with apparently positive results to show me because I'd always be able to, you know, fi find a problem. Although eventually in science, you then actually do make breakthroughs and things move forwards. But it's important to be self-critical. So, as I say, education is a gift that we're taking from today, from the last few years. That's very important. Experience also is very important, and you will acquire that during your careers. So back to the start, I would like to thank the university for conferring this honour upon me. And I hope that everyone here will enjoy the remainder of this day. I hope you'll take pleasure and pride in your achievement and in this great university, in this hall where we're sharing the day together. And I wish you all the best for your future careers.